It is my distinct pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Daniel Hofer. He's presented before, and, and he gave us an excellent breakout session last year with our standing room only. Uh, and it was very well received. He does a lot of good research and helps us keep real with what we should be doing rather than what we do. Uh, I think that's important. Evidence based as opposed to me who just says you shouldn't do that because it doesn't feel right. He has real reasons why you shouldn't do it. So you should listen to him and not necessarily to me. He is the Chief Medical Officer for Sharp Healthcare's Outpatient Palliative Care Program, which is called Transitions. Associate Medical Director for Sharp Hospice Care. He's board certified family physician and certified in palliative medicine. He spent over 25 years working in nursing homes and with geriatric patients. He's an epic trained physician who's been a visionary in the development of evidence-based disease management care model for late stage illness. He frequently presents at educational conferences around the country, including the Department of Justice and the World Congress of Geriatrics and Gerontology. Thank you. I got my tongue caught over my eye teeth and I couldn't see what I was saying. Anyway, please join me in welcoming Dr. Hofer. So thank you very much and I'm honored to be here. Um, all of that uh, education doesn't hold a candle to the last speaker um, and her bravery to stand up here. But hopefully this is the academic version and the need to change on the adult side of the population and also gives you some skill sets to actually speak to physician groups because that's what I do. So it's going to sound a little bit academic, but hopefully there's lots of good information for you. I would like you all to ask a question, too, as you listen to me speak today, and particularly with the case presentation, is uh, would your healthcare system do any better in managing this patient? And would it have been better in the case study I'm going to give you for this patient to completely have left your healthcare system out of their care? And you think I'm joking, I'm very serious because I lose sleep about these cases every single night because I think many of them would do better if we weren't there. If we weren't, not us in Pulse and Palliative Man, I'm talking about our healthcare systems, the healthcare industry. So what am I gonna be talking about today? I'm gonna to be talking about how to uh, stage the geriatric lifestyle and I'm gonna talk about how to prognosticate risk for our geriatric population. But being the evidence-based person that I am, I want to read something to you. And guess who this is from? It's American Heart Association, American College of Cardiologists, American uh, Geriatric Society. This was published just over one year ago in JAGS. So here it goes. The incidence and prevalence of most cardiovascular diseases increase with age, and cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death and major disability in adults age 75 and older. Despite the, effect, despite the effect of cardiovascular disease on quality of life, morbidity, and mortality in older adults, individuals aged 75 and older have been markedly underrepresented in most cardiovascular trials, and virtually all trials have excluded older adults with complex comorbidities, significant physical or cognitive disabilities, frailty, or residents in nursing homes and assisted living facilities. That's like 90% of the patients I've ever taken care of. Hey, hey Carl, does that sound like you're Carl Steinberg? Anybody, uh, yeah, where do you, any, any patients you know that don't fit into that category? Okay, so this is the, best, the better part. As a, as a result, current guidelines are unable to provide evidence-based recommendations for diagnosis and treatment of older adults typical of those encountered in routine clinical practice. First thing I have to say is, finally, followed by, we should applaud the American Heart Association and American Car College of Cardiology for having the bravery to finally stand up and say, we really don't know what we're doing for the advanced elderly. Because every time I went back to try to find out what to do for them, there was nothing to tell us specifically. There was standard of care, but there wasn't medical evidence. Now here's the part when I was reading this article that made me fall out of my chair, and then I danced with joy. A perverse, no, excuse me, a pervasive lack of evidence to guide clinical decision making in older adults with cardiovascular disease was found, 
as well as the paucity of data on the effects of diagnostic and therapeutic interventions on outcomes that are particularly important to older adults, such as quality of life, physical function, and the maintenance of independence. And they actually went on the rest of the article to talk about cognitive damage. So today we're going to be talking about cognitive damage and how to evaluate patients. Um, and if you ask uh, where this presentation came from, it came from 25 years of working in nursing homes and having worked through, uh, told these patients and their families how they got to where they were and then prognosticating where they would be going with their loved one, the families would look at me and say, why didn't anybody warn us? So now we're going to learn how to warn people. So I have no disclosures. Um, uh, my wife gets all my money, if you want to know where that goes. <laughs> it's a cardiac case study. It's actually based on a real patient, 92-year-old male, which I can tell you now, but uh, changed it to an 86-year-old female. She comes to see you. Uh, she's walking in her backyard, cleaning up after her poodle, and she has a syncopal episode. She's got a known history of stable angina, now developing just a little bit of exertional angina, and she's occasionally lightheaded. She's had no aortic stenosis for 10 years. Now she's a little bit more short of breath walking across a room with a cane, has some ankle edema. She has a front wheel walker, but never uses it. Never heard of that one. Feels generally weaker, has lost uh, and fatigued. She's lost about 12 pounds in the last year due to a change in appetite. The workup for the weight loss was unrevealing. That's the rest of her cardiac history. Um, and she has gout, moderate osteoarthritis and depression. She has a BMI of 21, generally inactive, and rarely gets out because she's just not up to it, and states she hasn't had the energy she used to for years. She does not drink or smoke. Um, she is now living with the daughter and son-in-law for the last couple of years. Both work. She doesn't drive, cook, or pay bills. She's mildly demented with an MMSC of 22. It's the type of MMSC that we are uh, well aware is not recognized in physicians and uh, nurses' offices routinely because they can still converse with us. And we're so busy, we're going in and out, they can still have conversations, and the things and the memory issues that they're having is not based on the conversations they have with healthcare providers. Her family doesn't want to admit she's demented, so they just say she's a little bit forgetful. And she wears glasses and hearing aids when she doesn't leave them on her counter. Um, her daughter states she needs more help because she's losing her strength. She's had a hysterectomy, a lap coli, and she's had a stage three heel ulcer that she, for which, uh, when that was repaired, she had delirium um, a, um, after she had a hip repair. This is the patient's medication list. You never see that, do you? And how do patients end up in on, on so many medications? It's because standard practice, when they see specialists, everybody's got to fix their segment of the body. And Medicare Five Stars and other things push us to putting people on more medications. But this slide is an example of an iatrogenic disease, polypharmacy of the elderly. And that's something that we have to start changing. Patient's blood pressure is a little bit low, heart rate's 52. She's alert and oriented, but easily distracted. She has no JVD. Heart's irregular, lungs are clear. There's no hepatojugular reflux. She has no focal neurologic deficits. Um, a little bit of edema, chest x-ray shows poor inspiration, no evidence of disease, moderately severe aortic stenosis, diastolic failure, mild decrease in left ventricular function, EKG shows AFib with a heart rate of 54, and these are the patient's abnormal laboratories. So what would happen to this patient if you had them walking out front, cleaning up after their dog, they had a syncopal episode in front of the neighbors, and the wife runs out, what do you think would happen? Call 911. Well, they called Nurse Connection, they called 911. Um, in this case, just like every other you know, institution I'm aware of. And they were seen in the ER, for which the doctors said, well, gosh, there's things we can fix. Let's go ahead and fix them. You need to get an angiogram and to consider surgery after the angiogram is obtained. But the future of healthcare, we need to start asking this question these types of questions, and these are the questions we need to ask before we proceed. Where in the life cycle does this patient belong? So I was trained as a family physician. I did hundreds of deliveries. I might have gone out to Okipamoki, wherever, and I would have been able to do some minor surgeries, appies, you know, uh, deliver babies and do all those types of things, but in the practice of taking care of pediatric patients, you would have been kicked out of healthcare if you treated a newborn like a toddler or a toddler like an adolescent patient just because they're all pediatric patients. 
They have different physiology and they have different psychosocial needs, some which obviously have been neglected historically. Well, when we get to the geriatric life cycle, there are clear stages of the geriatric life cycle, and it's not based on a time period, it's based on biologic or chronologic dates based on biologic date. And the most significant of these is when patients start to lose their physiologic and cognitive reserve. That is an entirely different group of patients than the younger and healthier geriatric population. We need to be able to distinguish patients who are starting to lose their physiologic and cognitive reserve from patients who have clearly manifested themselves as being pre-terminal, six months to about three years. And this patient, you'll see, without any question, is pre-terminal with one foot in the door of actually being hospice appropriate. How many people here would have qualified this patient for hospice? Could have. I've only seen a few hands go up when I answer that question. I'm going to show you why that is. But this is the group we call the advanced elderly. These are the groups, these are the patients that were historically deliberately excluded from research because they'd skew the results for the body of the patient population that we treat. And the fundamental error in the entire history of healthcare is that we extrapolated the results for which they were excluded back upon this group and said, hey, well, the line keeps going, it must be equally applicable. Only to find out today that we are wrong. So I recently read an article, a uh, study that was done up in Canada. They pulled uh, 24,000 randomized control trials. This was published in PLOS in 2015. And I didn't really like the study because the study starts looking at randomized control trials that only included 55-year-olds and older. And I'm lucky to be 55. And the number of randomized control trials for patients 55 years of age or older is only 7% of all of the randomized control trials. For 65 years of age and older, 2%. And for 75 years of age and older, 0.1%. So what you think you're doing in your advanced elderly population may not be as evidence-based as you've been led to believe. So that was just to show I could do things with a computer. By the way, the age at the top, that's because that's how old I was when I created this slide. It has nothing to do with 50 years old being actually the middle of the road. So these are clear research articles that uh, can tell you a patient's a preterminal patient. Uh, weight loss in the advanced elderly um, has about a two-year mortality rate, or excuse me, a 28% mortality about two years. Now, we, for those of us who do uh, primary care, we see weight loss in our elderly way before they're palliative or hospice appropriate. It's just a part of the normal geriatric life cycle. Um, but we need to recognize there is some prognostic significance to that. Incident heel ulcers are highly prognostic. Stage one or two has a 55% mortality at one year, and stage three or four has a 70% mortality. If you take all ulcers together, it's 68%, and if you do surgery on those patients, it drops a whole 9% down to 59%. Six out of 10 of them will still be dead in one year. Why is that? Because the heel ulcer is a reflection of the entire body's physiology and state of overall health. Delirium, the most common side effect of hospitalization in the advanced elderly has a 30% mortality at three months going up to 80% at three years. And imagine that. And how well are your institutions working with diagnosing delirium? Those mortality rates are worse than most advanced cancers and congestive heart failure. And what if you could tell your patients, I'm going to send you to the hospital to give you cancer of the mind while I fix your heart? Do you think patients would choose something differently? And his biomarkers, this was a study I've used long ago when I worked in nursing homes, uh, uh, for custodial nursing home patients that have a cholesterol less than 160, this is before the era of statins, a low albumin and low hemoglobin have an 84% mortality at one year versus 7% if they have none of them. And imagine the power you have and the ability to talk to your patients just by looking in, at any of these markers and foreseeing what's coming for the patient or their family. So what does that look like? There's the bell curve for weight loss. You don't really know what side of the bell curve they're on. There's delirium, there's heel ulcer, there's biomarkers. This patient's got a couple of weeks to maybe a year and a half to go. This patient 
is not this patient. So when you have a conversation with this patient about intermediate treatments, impulsed or advanced directives, you need to realize that everything else being the same, this patient here may not be as far along in the life cycle as this patient here. There's other risk factors you could have identified. Cognitive decline increases their risk of hospital-induced delirium by 500%. Depression increases cardiac mortality by 60%. Social isolation. I've heard all my friends are retiring. Let me just tell you this. The number one predictor of early mortality after smoking is social isolation. So stay engaged. There's actually a word in Japanese where, um, in Okinawa where people live the longest. It's called ikigai, have purpose. Make your life have some sort of meaning. So uh, please be sure that uh, even if your, your friends and your patients retire, that they have something that makes their life meaningful to wake up to every day. And polypharmacy is a concern. So the question, of course, then becomes, what is this patient's biggest concern, whether it's from the perspective of the physician or from the patient? My biggest concern is this patient will be overtreated, and I see it every single day. The other question is, how much does this patient's cardiac condition really play into her health status? Or is there something else going on here? And in fact, for many of these patients, I'll, I'll tell you the punchline, there is something going on. It's called geriatric syndromes. These geriatric syndromes are additional diseases we've never identified in the past or never brought to the surface that if you fix this, you will make this disease worse. It's a balance of decision making. All right. The other question is, do patients want to know, do providers want to know what stage of advanced age their patients belong to? Where did that come from? That came from being mortal. So who in this room has the bravery to raise their hand to say they didn't read the novel Being Mortal. <laughs> this isn't the first time I've actually seen this. The first time I saw this was in 1985. It was an editorial piece by a researcher out of The Lancet who asked the question, why has there been such little research in the professional skill of evidence-based medical prognostication? And the response was, well, perhaps physicians and providers need the uncertainty to justify the care they're about to impose upon their patient. How many people think that's still going on? Yeah. Next question. This patient's risk of hospital-induced delirium is, I'll let you think which answer you think is correct. This is a prognostic model de developed by Sharon Inouye. Uh, cognitive decline, poor vision, functional impairment, high comorbidities, any restraint. This patient's high risk and has a 63% risk of developing hospital-induced delirium and a 64% chance of being dead or in a nursing home within a year. And you know that before the patient goes to the hospital. There's other prognostic models. I always tell my colleagues and physician providers, nurse providers, get a model, stick it in your pocket. Just get some reference so you can start thinking about these types of issues. There are multiple risk factors for hospital-induced delirium. They happen to be uh, the same as post-operative delirium. You can look at all of these. It's just that surgery tends to be more of an insult to the body, so has, tends to have worse outcomes. They're not all equal. Uh, cognitive decline is more important than hearing or visual changes. And certain surgeries, such as aortic valve uh, surgeries or orthopedic surgeries, are worse uh, than other risk factors. Age matters. Starting at the age of 65 or 7, people start to lose their cognitive reserve. And you can tell an 80-year-old if you're planning a surgery where they're going to end up in the ICU, there's about a 75% chance they'll develop hospital-induced delirium. And if they're 90, it's almost guaranteed. Guaranteed. Next question. It's important to recognize you might develop delirium because delirium is associated with all of the following long-term consequences except Delirium is only associated with short-term but not long-term consequences. Delirium is associated with higher mortality, longer lengths of stay, higher rates of readmission, permanent cognitive and functional decline, and higher rates of institutionalization. Now, I was educated in the 80s, the mid-80s, and I was educated incorrectly because the incorrect answer is number one. Delirium is an acute emergency with no long-term consequences. We have found out that that is absolutely not true. Is one of the tools I used to use when I worked in nursing homes post-acute care. 
patients would come out of the hospital. And by the way, it is extremely uncommon, extremely uncommon for um, hospitalists or physicians to write hospital-induced delirium. It's hyperactive, it's hypoactive, it's prevalent, it's incident, how long they had it, and give a real professional diagnosis of this syndrome. But they almost never say anything, which is the real problem. So you had to go back, and where would you find the best chance of any indication the patient had hospital-induced delirium? <laughs> Nurses' notes. They were great. Because they said the patient's agitated, refusing to take medications, they're just really lethargic and not responding. Those were the clues that you would have to investigate further that this patient had hospital-induced delirium. But it mattered to me because patients who came into my nursing home with delirium had a 500% increased risk of being dead at six months. It goes from 5 to 25%. They also were the ones that uh, tended to be worse and stayed institutionalized. Multiple research articles show um, the higher mortality rates, and these were actually some of the original research articles, so if you want some additional reading, there you go. We tend to think of delirium as just the direct brain insult, the hypoxia, the anesthesia, the depth of anesthesia, those types of issues, but we forget there's an aberrant stress response. Now, I'm going to presume that some of the people in this room have had a UTI, and you did not get delirium. What does it mean when you get delirium with a UTI? It means you don't have the cognitive reserve to tolerate the inflammatory process that's going on. And there should be a gigantic banner bar across every person's chart, medical records, that this patient has developed delirium because that's a warning sign that that patient is at risk. The only people that are worse off are the people that activate the LHPA axis, those patients that we see moved from the ICU to the regular floor, the floor to the nursing home, from Northern California to Southern California, or vice versa, and they become irritated, agitated, and confused, inattentive, and disorganized. Those patients are extremely high risk of anything we do to them. Just to show you how significant this is, this reminds me, almost to the day I was uh, here in um, uh, Garden Grove, um, two hotels down, speaking to case managers, Southern California case managers decided there's about 400 people in a packed room. And I asked them, how many of you knew um, that if you sent a person over the age of 60 uh, for a cardiovascular intervention, if they don't de develop delirium, there's about a one in five chance they'll uh, have a significant decrease in their cognitive status and a one in three if they develop delirium. How many of you knew that? Send your patients for heart surgery. At one year, 20% of patients who don't develop delirium will have a statistically significant permanent decrease in their MMSE status, that means three points or more, and one in three if they develop hospital-induced delirium. Heart disease is associated with cognitive decline, the interventions for that. And I hate this study because I'm almost 60 years old, kind of really. I always joke with my patients, whatever surgeries we're going to have for you in your lifetime, we're going to do them at 59. I don't know what they're going to be, we're just going to do them all. <laughs> the question, of course, then becomes, is delirium the precursor for dementia? And I'm not going to get into an extended discussion about the difference between causation and association. But this was an orthopedic research article. Uh, patients went for either fracture or elective repair of their hips or knees. They had no pre-existing cognitive hearing or visual deficit. This was a five-year perspective study, and for those patients that developed hospital-induced delirium, they were 10 and a half times more likely to be diagnosed with dementia in that five-year window. In a meta-analysis of studies such as this, published in JAMA in 2010, they were 12.52 times more likely to be diagnosed with dementia in a 4.1 year window. So imagine this, you can prognosticate who's at risk of developing delirium, and if they survive, they're 12 and a half times more likely to be demented. You think your patients would want to know that? Multiple research articles, again, this is an old article, but if you want to start where I started, these are the research articles I read to validate that type of information. What actually happens? Patients get delirium and tends to fluctuate. Demented patients on the top in this slide, uh, uh, non-demented patients on the bottom. Because it's fluctuating at about two to six months, it hits a nadir and we tend to think everything's okay. But for many of these patients, the symptoms of delirium just tend to return. What are those symptoms? Inattention, disorganized thinking, disorientation. That's executive function. 
Uh, when I was at the case manager study, uh, talk, I told them, look, you cannot send a patient home with executive function. Does not matter how good you think you are at your discharge planning, they will be back because they cannot follow your directions. And inattention was the other concern, memory loss. So I give this talk to lots of uh, providers now. Um, who worries about mortality? Surgeons, it's, I mean, and physicians. It's a big metric to physician providers. We don't want to see our patients die. Who cares about institutionalization? Patients and their families. They don't want to be institutionalized. They actually, they hate it. I actually give this exact same presentation to the public. I just changed the vernacular and, and the things that I explain. And who cares about readmissions? Administrators and policymakers. It is one of the most easily accessible conditions that we could improve care in this country if we started highlighting the importance of hospital-induced delirium and were effective and accurate, not at diagnosis and treating, but prognosticating and preventing delirium. Just to show you, I was accused once of not talking enough about uh, the functional decline with delirium, so I threw in a slide. This is just to show if patients develop hospital-induced delirium. Um, at one month, post-surgically, these patients have a 2.6 odds ratio of having ADL decline over those that did not, and decreased ambulation was 2.6, and death or nursing home pa placement was three times higher. Is there actually evidence-based research to tell that these things matter? And the answer is yes. Respectively, 75 and 90 percent of patients, the elderly, the advanced elderly patients, would forego treatment even if the treatment was minimal, if there was a significant chance of functional or cognitive impairment. And that compares to almost 100% of those same patients who say, of course I'll go if there's no significant risk. What didn't they prioritize? They didn't prioritize death. That was not the number one concern. We have it backwards. Our patients are more willing to die. They want to maintain their quality of life. Quality of life first. They do care about mortality, but it's only after you keep up their quality of life. Just to drive this point home, this is another study. I like to drive this point home, especially for physicians. Randomized control trial. Multiple questions were asked, but two of them included this. Um, if you had a significant hip fracture and you fell, these were for seven, uh, women 75 years of age and older, and they were widowed, and I think of my grandma literally baking cookies, or it act, you know, 75 year olds now are actively involved in many things. But I think of elderly patients um, that are living independently, having great lives, and they were told if you break your hip, and, uh, we could repair it perfectly, but you would be institutionalized, what would you prefer? Institutionalization or death? 80% chose death. Death. They would prefer to die than live in an institution. Now, there's lots of ways to go about that. We can improve our institutions, or we can simply ask our patients what is most meaningful to them. And perhaps a patient going for a hip repair or a knee repair that was actually getting along pretty well with a front wheel walker and four hydrocodone a day should stay on four hydrocodone and use their front wheel walker. I have patients in my personal practice that have refused surgery because when they were told they had to have surgery, I said, you can go for surgery, that's not the problem, but let me tell you the rest of the story before you go. Next question. This patient has an anticholinergic burden score of 036 greater than 12. Dr. Hofer, what's an anticholinergic burden score? And why do we care? So when you look at a patient's medication list, regardless of whether it has 2,000 medications on it or not, the first concern you should have is polypharmacy. Six or more medications. Count them. One, two, three, four, five, six. How many people do you see with six or less medications in the geriatric population? Six or more medica uh, medications means that they will have almost a 14 times increased risk of having hospital-induced delirium. Even four or five medications get them a nine times increased risk. Next in line are anticholinergic medications, not opioids. Anticholinergic medications put it about four and a half to 12 times greater, followed by sedative hypnotics, followed by psychoactive medications, and way on the bottom there are opioids. Opioids have a dose effect. 
But if you get a board question or if you ever want to know for your patients what's most important to prognosticate their risk, it's polypharmacy, anticholinergic medications, and then psychoactive sleep, uh, all those sleepers that we give patients except for melatonin. Let's take a look at this patient's list, and literally I could spend an hour talking about this patient's list again. Uh, but I'm going to show you some of the things that would happen if they came to my community-based palliative care program, if they consulted me about what to do for their meds. Let's count the ACB score. Uh, metoprolol gets a point of one, DIG gets one, allopurinol one, furosemide one, oxybutynin three, Paxil two, Flexeril two, hydrocodone one, Tylenol PM three. This patient is in big trouble. And studies done in New Zealand and socialized healthcare industries per patient per point per year. So you have a group that has ACB score of zero and all these other patients that have various ACB scores. Per patient per point per year, there's about a 10 to 12% increase of falls, hospitalizations, death, and doctor's visits per patient per point. Per patient per point per year, there is a 13% increased risk of being diagnosed with dementia just by being on these meds. I personally believe that we are causing much of the dementia in this country, another iatrogenic disease. You come to my palliative care program, this is what your medication list would look like. And having said that, you might think, well, you stopped a lot of medications that were on there uh, besides anticholinergic meds, and I did, but I don't have, to have time to go into all of that. But I do want to make this point. Sorry, guys, over here to the left. You guys weren't sleeping well, and a few months ago you said, oh, I'm going to go to this great conference for the California Coalition, so I'm going to start taking Tylenol PM. And you've been taking that every night for the last three months. And you guys over here said, I'm going to listen to Dr. Hofer, and I'm going to use non-pharmacologic sleep protocol, and I'm going to avoid my caffeine, I'm going to exercise, I'm going to listen to soft music, and I'm going to learn about the HELP program, or the NICHE program, that are excellent evidence-based hospital programs to help people sleep, and you have an ACB score of zero because you're not on anything, and you have an ACB score of three because you chose Tylenol PM. These research articles are all based on a patient have one pill of an ACB score of two or three, or three pills of a score of one, compared to those people with zero. Well, you guys over here, unfortunately, at 90 days, have about 2.7 times incre increased risk of being diagnosed with co uh, mild cognitive impairment. At two years, you will have a statistically significant decrease in your MMSE score, and that's for normal cognitive patients. It's small, but it's statistically significant. And if you go to surgery, you're more than twice as likely to have post-operative delirium. The good news? You'll have forgotten everything I said by the end of this talk. <laughs> the all hat LLT trial, which was a cardiovascular trial, showed that for primary prevention for patients 75 years of age or older, if they're on a statin, it trends towards higher mortality. It trends towards higher mortality if they're on for primary prevention. There's other cardiovascular studies which show the same thing. In fact, to get a benefit from a statin, you have to be on it for about two to five years, which challenges me as to why anybody who's in the preterminal period or in a nursing home is why on a statin. This is a randomized control trial by Amy Abernathy, and she went to physicians, oncologists, and other specialists and said, do you think the patient has about a year to go? Half were cancer patients, half were other medical diagnoses. Uh, randomized half to stay on their statin, half to stop. The group that stopped the statin lived 39 days longer. They had statistically significant improvements in their quality of life. And they saved a little bit of money, too. SSRIs, highly under valued in the consequences of their utilization. And the younger and healthier population, we use them a lot, and the big side effect that we worry about because of different physiology for the younger and healthier population is sexual side effects. But in the advanced elderly, you put a patient on an SSRI and they're more than twice as likely to fall and have a fracture, a statistically significant fracture. They're more than, uh, and that's actually worse than uh, PPIs and glucocorticoids, which people worry about a lot. And they also are a statistically uh, increased risk of upper GI bleeds, intracranial hemorrhages, post-surgical bleeding. And for this particular patient, who's on a non-steroidal and an SSRI, 
there is a 1,500%, 15 times greater risk of having an upper GI bleed. Patients can get electrolyte abnormalities, and they can get idiopathic agitation. So um, hospice medical providers, physician providers, nurse providers, how many of you have had an agitated patient where you stopped their SSRI and they cleared up? Anybody? I see a few. Good. Excellent. See, you're aware of that concern. So Dr. Hofer, you perseverate about polypharmacy, and this is another example. This is 75 to age 80 on the left, 80 to 85 on the right, 10 or more medications on the bottom, five or less on the top. In a five-year window, people with polypharmacy between 70 and 75, about 30 uh, more patients will be dead at five years, and about 40 um, if they're 80 to 85. And the first response they always get, well, they're on more medicines because they have more medical problems. That's true. It's just not the whole story. The other part of the story is the polypharmacy and the change in physiology that occurs with the geriatric population, for which, thank God, the American Heart Association and others hopefully will follow suit and come out and say, we don't know yet. We really don't know how to advise you because polypharmacy is a dangerous disease. Using prognostic modeling, this patient's um, post-hospital risk of functional decline is, I'll let you guess. This was made by Mark Sager from UCSF, increased age, decreased cognitive abilities, IADL deficiencies. There's the scoring tool. Sorry, I'm going through quickly because I know you guys are going to get the slides. Patient has a 55% chance of having some level of functional decline. When was the last time you heard a physician say, if you go to the hospital, for any reason you're going to come out with, you have a less than 50% chance of coming out functionally the same way you went in? And we can tell people this. This patient has how many characteristics of geriatric frailty syndrome and why should we care? So you should know by now that I'm giving you a you know, patient phenotype that has absolutely every characteristic of the risk model, so the answer for this one is five out of five. And this uh, frailty phenotype was adapted by the American Geriatric so Society. It was from Linda Freed. There's three of the following five issues, uh, loss of strength, weight loss, poor activity level, and, uh, poor endurance, and slow performance. And I implore you, please do a professional evaluation. Don't guess. You know, my wife said, don't tell this joke, but I'm going to tell it anyways. I said, I used to know what porn was until my mom moved three townhomes up from me, and now she watches movies with us with some sexual scene in it, and I can't stand it anymore. Now, now I really know what porn looks like because I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> so what is frailty? It's a physiologic syndrome characterized by decreased reserve and diminished resistance to stressors. Uh, resulting from cumulative decline across multiple physiologic systems and causing vulnerability to adverse outcomes. And what does all that gobbledygook mean? It it's, uh, means that this patient does not have reserve in any of their organ systems. Nothing's winning the race. It's like that car that you have that has 300 or 400,000 miles on. It might get you from point A to B, but God forbid if anything goes, the whole thing's gone. This is the pathophysiology of the syndrome. It's a loss of skeletal muscle. It's called sarcopenia. That is a geriatric syndrome that has prognostic significance and a significant amount of evidence-based medical literature behind it. I'm sorry to tell you all, but starting at the age of 30, we're about a half a pound less muscle per year, and that accelerates at age 50 and then again at age 70. And unfortunately, we're almost a pound more fat every year. So to stay the same weight and the same physique, you've got to work harder and eat less. That's the reward for getting older. Um, it's also associated with neuroendocrine dysfunction and chronic inflammation. Why does that fat and muscle tissue matter? It's because your adipose tissue is secreting a pro-inflammatory cytokine, a pro-inflammation chemical called interleukin-6 and other uh, what, what the Mayo Clinic has labeled adipokines, hormones that raise your inflammatory status, and muscle decreases that with anti-inflammatory cytokines. And this is some of what your pro-inflammatory cytokines eventually expose when you get older. These are the diseases of the elderly. So you get to, I, I actually propose, this is a third endocrine process. You have adolescence, you have menopause, and I don't have a better term for it, so I call it end of life opons. You're <laughs> expressing, your genetic expression of the diseases comes when these cytokine ratios get to a point where your genetics can show you who you actually are um, underneath. 
also leads to the cognitive decline or the risk of cognitive decline. And we need to be very careful because we put these in the hospital, patients in the hospital, and they get acute on chronic cognitive damage. So that's a lot about frailty, but why did I bring it up? Because you can use frailty to predict outcomes. A patient with frailty syndrome who you send to surgery will be in the hospital almost twice as long for a major procedure. And nobody should be surprised about this then from what I just told you about muscle mass. Because when we are hospital, the people in this room are hospitalized, we lose about one to one and a half percent of our muscle strength per day. But the geriatric, the advanced geriatric population in particular, they lose 5% of their muscle strength per day. So the patient that you sent to the hospital with their front wheel walker that had the autonomy to be able to walk around their house and live independently is in the hospital and loses 40% of their muscle strength. Are you actually surprised that they never walk again? And that's something we need to be aware of. These patients will have more than twice as many hospital complications. Um, about 17% even for minor procedures will be institutionalized and approaches half of these patients being institutionalized if they go for a major procedure. I have to translate this into real daily care that I deal with too because uh, a couple of months ago I was in a joint ops meeting for two of our medical groups in one of our hospitals. And after all the times I've given these talks to my own associates and medical groups, uh, we were sitting there and one, at the end of the meeting, um, one of the providers there said, if only we had a way to identify the 20% of the population that causes us so much problem in the hospital. <laughs> and I, I sat there thinking, is this just another example where consciously or subconsciously we don't want to recognize that there's a problem? This patient has uh, this patient's risk of hospital-associated disability is, God forbid, Dr. Hofer, where do you come up with these things? What is hospital-associated disability and why should we care? Hospital-associated disability is a condition that's defined as the loss of one ADL needed to live independently without assistance, or it's actually been expanded to actually any patient has to move to a higher level of care and cannot live independently. It occurs in 30% of people over the age of 70 who are hospitalized. It occurs even if the illness is successfully treated and has no direct relationship to the illness. Remember, here's the disease, organ system disease way of thinking we're used to, but now we have all these geriatric syndromes to deal with. Less than half these people with had have recovered to their pre-illness levels at one year. And that's true, but that's not exactly the way we want to remember the information, because this is what you want to know. 41% of these patients will be dead within a year. Of the survivors, less than half go to the way they were before. Now let me tell you something about research too. This was the experimental group. The validation cohort mortality rate was 67%. Do you think a patient would want to know that they have a condition for which if they are hospitalized, they'll be dead 67%, 41% of the time within a year? Prognostic talk. Prognostic model. Risk factors to cubitus ulcer, cognitive impairment, functional impairment, low social activity level. This patient has an 83% chance of developing hospital-associated disability. There is some good news coming. <laughs> National Surgical Quality Improvement Program recommended six years ago and then two years ago again that all patients going to surgery in this country, every last one of them, age 70 years of age and older, minor intervention, major intervention, should have some type of cognitive evaluation. Minicog was what they recommended. I would strongly recommend people do the full MMSC, MOCA, anything that's more um, thorough, uh, because you'll miss early dementia if you use the Minicog. They're also recommending that we do a geriatric, professional geriatric frailty evaluation on anybody age 70 years of age or older. Now, we know we can make a recommendation. Raise your hands if your institution is doing that 100% of the time. Not yet. As a palliative provider, this is a mini version of a tool I've created. I've given it to C, uh, CAPC, and CAPC will now uh, provide an educational module for anybody who wants to learn how to do a geropalliative evaluation or hospital or surgical risk for your patients. However, I'm a community-based palliative care provider, and palliative medicine to me is not about dying. 
Palliative medicine is about living. And the way to live better is to forewarn your patients and your patient population as far upstream as you can or should so they know what's coming. And I have long ago recommended that we do a geropalliative evaluation on patients starting at the age of 65 and then every few years we can have a debate about how, many, how often it should be done, but there should be some context even when your patients are perfectly fine because it helps them understand what's coming for them in the next few decades. There's lots of benefits from doing a geropalliative evaluation. Just to show you what uh, we might be able to accomplish, uh, this was a multi-center trial done at the VA. Uh, surgeons asked palliative providers to do a uh, evaluation prior to surgery. And what they found was that when the physician provider, uh, palliative provider got involved, there was a 33% decrease in mortality whether the patient went to surgery or not. Can you imagine a pill? Would you take a pill that decreased your risk by 33% if you were going to go to surgery or not? If I knew I wasn't going to be dead in six months? Just, and all this is is a consultation. What I didn't tell you in this slide is that the number of patients who refused surgery went from 5.7 up to 19.6%. Almost quadrupled because they were given full disclosure about the potential consequences of their care. I want you to read this really close because there's a lot of hope coming. <laughs> this is from circulation. So whenever I go and speak, I get asked to speak to my professional colleagues all the time. Here's a little pearl. Go into their literature. It's full of good stuff. They just don't know how to use it yet. I want you to read what the journal circulation says patients, uh, physicians should be doing for every, every single year on their patients with heart disease, heart failure in this case. Number seven is discussion should include outcomes beyond survival, including major adverse events, symptom burden, functional limitations, loss of independence, quality of life, and obligations for caregivers. Number eight is as the end of life is anticipated, clinicians should take responsibility for initiating the development of comprehensive plan of care consistent with the patient's wishes, preferences, and goals. And assessing and integrating emotional readiness of the patient and family is vital to effective communication. That's cardiologists. I guess they never read it. They didn't read it. <laughs> this is also from the journal circulation, but this is how you get your foot in the door. It's one of my favorite palliative slides, except for one error. Venn diagram, survival bubble should be smaller, and the quality of life bubble should be much larger. But at least they're owning up to what we all know is important. That it's not about fixing the organ, it's about fixing the patient. One of the things I do applaud them for is recognizing the cost burden, because that is a health issue to me, and I see it every day in my family practice, where patients are choosing between medications and food, medications and rent. And we have not solved the health care problem or the insurance problem. Having insurance doesn't mean a whole lot to me anymore, because a lot of people are not getting the health care that they need. By the way, anybody know um, how many patients the American Heart Association says will bankrupt managing their heart failure? Any guesses? 25%. One out of four patients with heart failure will be bankrupt by us trying to manage their heart failure. So here we are in the future. Multiple geriatric syndromes. Community, public, hopefully will demand that we change because we have to start balancing the benefits of organ system disease interventions with patient-centered quality outcomes. What are patient-centered quality outcomes? Am I going to develop cognitive decline? Am I going to develop functional decline, be institutionalized, or become an emotional and financial burden to our families? And I think I'm going to add on there post-traumatic stress disorder. This slide just reminds me to tell you that our population is getting a lot older, and they are far more vulnerable even to minor procedures and interventions. And even though our uh, you know, researchers are coming up with better ways to be less invasive, that's not good enough. We still have to evaluate the risk for our patients. It also reminds me to tell you the rest of the story. So this 92-year-old uh, family, very loving and kind family, took their demented 92-year-old dad who was able to walk the dog and clean up after him and recognize the family to one of our local hospitals. The doctors, the nurses, the hospitalists, the cardiologists got all excited. There's something we can do, and they did it. And they put him in the hospital. 
They told him if he didn't get this fixed, he'd be dead within a year. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what they said. And he had a horrible outcome. Uh, he spent two weeks in the hospital and had severe hospital-induced delirium. When I picked him up was two weeks later because he came to my nursing home and I sat down with him and the son because the patient really wasn't cognitive enough to have a conversation. And I walked him through how he got to where he was and the son looked at me and he said, what the hell are you guys doing? Why didn't you warn us? A hundred days later, he was, the patient was still in the wheelchair and he still did not recognize his family. And I still feel, boy, <clears throat> I didn't expect this either. <laughs> I still feel the suffering that that family went through because of what we did to them. It's not acceptable. And what really bothers me to this day is that medical research would still report that patient as a good outcome. Because our metrics for how we evaluate care does not include patient-centered quality metrics. Didn't have a stroke, didn't have kidney damage, he didn't have a heart attack, he didn't have a GI bleed, he didn't die, All right? I give it an we have to change the way we practice healthcare, and we need it sooner than later. I would make one more appeal to you um, when you go back to your institutions that I personally don't believe that it's our patient's responsibility to get sick so that we can finance ourselves or feel better about our professional skills. And when you look at patients in your silo or any silo in your institution, you have to ask yourself, would I even need to be doing this if we did a better job warning our patients and managing them upstream? Because that's really good health care. Perhaps we have some room to improve. So thank you very much.